92.1 WROI, WROIFM.com. Streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5, and pretty soon we'll have audio and video on RTC Channel 4. Welcome, Scott. Welcome, Tom. Day number two in a row. Nice to have you with us. Good to see you, sir. You do have your own coffee cup now, don't you? I would think so. I think that's probably appropriate, <laughs> indeed. And, of course, download the TuneIn Radio app. Take us wherever you happen to be going. 61 <clears> degrees, <throat> our current temperature reading. Going to a high today of 81. And we welcome to the studio Dr. Michael Brubaker, who's going to be talking about vaccinations today. Dr. Brubaker, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Tom. You're the Woodlawn Hospital, Fulton County Medical Clinic. All that running together, right? That is correct. All right. By the way, we'll invite our listeners as we go through the course of the program today. If you have a question for Dr. Brubaker, pick up the phone. Give us a call, 223-6059. We call this program Doc Talk. And we want to talk with the doctors, but we also want to find out what's on your mind. So 223-6059. Dr. Brew Baker, vaccinations. Thank you uh, for inviting me, first of all. Um, vaccinations, both the childhood and adult, is something that I'm uh, passionate about uh, for several reasons. But uh, one of them is that people kind of take vaccinations uh, for granted, I think. Uh, medically, the vaccination program worldwide has been a huge success, and that's particularly uh, true here in the United States. Uh, in fact, it's been such a success that I think a lot of times we take it for granted. Uh, I also will say that there's a lot of information on the internet that um, is not based on fact concerning immunizations, and um, I'm hoping today I can present some factual information that will help people uh, straighten out their thought processes, perhaps. So you're saying there's a lot of misinformation out there that, that people correct. are kind of grasping a hold of instead of finding out exactly what the situation is. That is correct. Okay. There's a lot of untruths out okay. there. Okay. Um, I also will put in a disclaimer right up front. If I say something that contradicts what your own health care provider has told you, I please uh, go with what they have said. They obviously know your individual situation better than I. That's an important note. There's um, three parts to... Uh, this visit today, I would like to, uh, first of all, kind of take a step back in history and talk about the uh, immunization uh, program before it started and the disease processes that were prevalent at that time and the success that we've had uh, combating those diseases. And then I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the immune process and how we develop immunity to diseases and how vaccines actually work. And then I'd like to talk about individual uh, vaccines, both okay. children and adult, and perhaps some new vaccines that are that are now available. Um, so anyway, if um, if I could, I'd like to start out by talking about uh, what things looked like uh, several uh, decades ago. And this okay. is information that I got from the CDC website. Um, and it says back in the 1920s, diphtheria was one of the most dreaded childhood diseases in the United States, killing over 10,000 people every year. We started vaccinating children against diphtheria in the 1930s and 40s, and the disease started disappearing. And I have to admit, today, as old as I am, I have never yet seen a case of diphtheria. Is that right? Excellent. So, obviously, the uh, diphtheria vaccine has been successful uh, in this country. That's not necessarily true in other countries. Measles. In 1962, before we started vaccinating for measles, there were 500,000 cases reported in the U.S. Ten years after that, it was down to 32,000 cases. Ten years after that, there were fewer than 2,000 cases, uh, and now only about 100 cases reported each year. The significance of measles is that many of those people end up being hospitalized, and the death rate is one in 1,000. They can be pretty severe, can't they? Correct. So back in 1962, statistically, there should have been 500 uh, people died from measles. I had it, but I didn't die, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I had it also. Um, that was before the age of uh, immunization. Right. Um, there have been some recent outbreaks, and this is something we're going to talk about a bit later here in people who are not immunized. Um, we may remember back in 1983 down at Indiana University, they had a, uh, an epidemic of measles on campus. There were actually 174 students who came down with measles. Most of these students had been vaccinated uh, in childhood, but their vaccine had waned, their immunity had waned. And that actually is what prompted the requirement now that people have a booster uh, vaccination against measles uh, to help uh, correct that situation. 
And another example of what can happen in just uh, earlier this year, in Clinton County, Indiana, there was a 17-year-old girl who went to Romania on a mission trip. <clears throat> Her vaccinations were not up to date. And remember, these diseases are more prevalent in other countries. Well, she picked up the measles organism, brought it back to her home county. <clears throat> 32 people who also were not up to date on their immunizations ended up coming down with measles. Several of them had to be hospitalized, but fortunately none of them died. Wow. So <clears throat> these, these diseases are still prevalent worldwide. And that's a point that I want to make. Even though we may not hear or see cases like this in the United States, we're not confined to Fulton County anymore. You know, our world now has become much larger and people routinely travel to China and Mexico and other countries where these diseases may be prevalent. And that will probably just increase with time, so. I would think so. Get them up to date. Um, in 64 and 65, um, according to the CDC, rubella infected 12 and a half million people. That was prior to immunizations in America. Uh, it killed 2,000 children and it caused 11,000 miscarriages. Um, we hardly ever see or hear rubella now because of immunizations. Uh, in fact, in 2012, which is the latest data that I have, there were only nine cases of rubella uh, reported in the U.S. Um, I'd like to, I think you get the point, okay. that immunizations have been successful over these last uh, decades. Of Particularly here in, in the United States. States. That's correct. And I'd like to talk a little bit about immunity and how it's developed. Okay. <clears throat> there are two types of immunity, basically. There's both active and there's passive. Um, active immunity is when your body comes in contact with a particular disease organism, whether it's a virus or bacteria or even a fungus. Your body's immune system <clears throat> recognizes that uh, organism as being foreign and it stimulates an immune response. Uh, against that organism and uh, it takes several days for that immune response to develop so in the meantime you actually have become ill. For example with the um, common cold virus uh, when you pick up the virus if it's a virus that you've not been exposed to before your body's immune system particularly the B lymphocytes they're called will recognize that organism as being foreign and will develop an immune response but it's going to take about seven days for it to fight it off. So in the meantime, you've got a sore throat and a cough and a fever and you feel pretty lousy. Now the important thing about that is that your body has the ability to remember that organism. Uh, there's what's called the plasma cells, which are part of the B lymphocytes, will remember that organism so that the next time you're exposed to that particular virus, your immune system will immediately react and fight it off. So you may wake up some morning and say, Gosh, I feel kind of sluggish today, I've got a little cold or whatever, but later in the day or the next day you feel fine, probably you have picked up that virus and your body just fought it off. That's active immunity. Okay. The unfortunate part about that is you got to get sick in order to develop it. <laughs> the other type of immunity is what we call passive immunity, and that's what we get with immunizations. And the way they work, the way they're developed, is they take a piece of the virus or a piece of the bacteria that they know will stimulate the body's immune system and they give it to you, usually by injection. Your body's immune system does exactly the same thing. It develops antibodies. It puts those antibodies in storage, in memory, so that the next time you're exposed to that organism, uh, it stimulates the immune system and you fight off the organism. Uh, the nice thing about that is you just fought it off without becoming sick and that's how vaccines work. Is that, is that uh, the flu shot perhaps? Flu shot works that way. Actually, all the immunizations okay. work that same that same way. Okay. Um, they don't give you the whole organism, or if they do, the organism is killed, so that you don't get the actual disease when they inject you with the vaccine. Um, that's a common misconception. People oftentimes say, "I got the flu from the flu shot." That's <laughs> not really happen. not going to happen. <laughs> they would have got the flu whether they got the flu shot or not. Probably, uh, if it was even the flu, it may have just been the common cold. So anyway, that's the advantage to okay. uh, immunizations. You can get passive immunity without actually getting sick. Um, one other concept that I would like to present, and this is a little bit uh, confusing perhaps, but it's very important, and that is the concept of what's called herd immunity. Herd actually uh, comes from the fact that this 
um, applies to agriculture as well. If you have a herd of cattle, the um, the phenomenon here is the same as, as it is of the herd of people in Fulton County, Indiana. Okay. And that is the concept that if you have 100 people in Rochester who are not immunized um, and there's a organism that comes to Rochester, influenza for example, chances are very good that all 100 of those people are going to come down with influenza. And those people are then going to spread it to their co-workers and their family members and you know whoever they come in contact with and you've got an epidemic. If a significant number, on the other hand, of the people in Rochester are immunized with the flu shot in this case, let's say that 95 out of those 100 people have had their flu shot, the five who have not are probably going to come down with the flu, but the chances of them spreading it on a wide scale uh, and causing an epidemic are pretty slim if 95% of the, of the herd has been vaccinated. Okay. Um, so that's a very important concept, and that's why we, we push vaccines so heavily. There are certain people like uh, newborn infants, for example, um, pregnant women, people who are immunocompromised because of chemotherapy or organ transplants, perhaps can't have a particular vaccination. So <clears throat> that's, that makes up the five out of the hundred in my example who were not vaccinated. They could not be vaccinated. Uh, but everybody else should be to help uh, build up the herd immunity. Okay. okay? So that's an important concept. Okay. Now we are fortunate in this country and particularly in, in Indiana in that our immunization rates are very high and I give the, the people of Fulton County uh, kudos for that. According to the latest figures which I could get which was 19, I'm sorry, 2013, pardon me, 2013, 94% uh, of the people ages two months through 18 years were actually up to date on their immunization. So that's tremendous. That is good. Um, one of the reasons for that, in Indiana it is more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult for people to opt out of immunizations than it is in some other states. In Indiana you can, <clears throat> there's two reasons why you can not get your children immunized, for example. One of them is a religious objection, mm -hmm. if that is uh, truly uh, against your beliefs, you're allowed to not get your children or yourself immunized or if your physician signs a statement that you cannot, for a medical reason, have a particular immunization. Um, other states are much more relaxed, particularly western states. Um, Colorado and California, if I can pick on two of them, sure. are very relaxed about immunizations. Uh, that's also why we had the measles outbreak at Disneyland, um, because that's an example of the herd effect that we were talking about somebody from somewhere else in the world, and there's lots of world travelers who come to Disneyland, uh, and there was a large percentage of the people in that area were not immunized, and the first thing you know, you had an epidemic. Uh, so that can happen, okay? Okay. Um, I will also put in a plug here for what we call the CHIRP system. CHIRP <clears throat> stands for Children and Hoosier Immunization Registry Program. Uh, it's something that the state of Indiana came up with just a few years ago. It's an internet reporting program which any provider, uh, doctor, nurse, health department, uh, anybody who administers immunizations can enroll in uh, and record any immunizations that they've given to any patient. Um, and up until July 1st of this year it was voluntary. Starting July 1st it became mandatory uh, to report. The nice thing about that is now any school nurse can look up a student's CHIRP report. In fact, they do it on every student every year to make sure that their immunizations are up to date. Okay. And if not, then they start sending out reminders that kids uh, need immunizations. So other states, uh, some other states have similar systems, but not all of them. So we really are kind of ahead of the game there, I think, in that respect. All right. Um, I want to go through... <clears throat> some of the immunizations. I know that all of them go by initials or letters and it can be very confusing uh, to, the, to the public. You bring your kids in to get shots, you don't really know what it is that they're getting, so maybe I can, can help a little bit in that respect. Um, hepatitis B, uh, that's a three-shot series that we give up through the age of 18 months to children. 
Uh, hepatitis B is a very, very serious disease. Um, and it can lead to liver failure, can lead to liver cancer, and obviously to death. Since we started immunizing, which hasn't been all that many years ago, the incidence of those diseases have gone down dramatically. Um, the big problem we have now is hepatitis C, which at this point there is no vaccine for. Okay. Um, and hopefully someday there will be. Another uh, childhood vaccination is rotavirus. Uh, that's a three uh, dose, actually it's oral, uh, that's given uh, two, four, and six months. Uh, rotavirus used to be a very severe form of diarrhea that put lots of, of kids, lots of children, babies in particular, in the hospital because of dehydration. Um, and that's um, pretty much unheard of now. Another big one is the DPT. Uh, this is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, or whooping cough. Uh, that's a five-shot series that's given from two months of age up through kindergarten. Uh, as I said earlier, I have never seen a case of diphtheria. Uh, I'm sure it is still around. It certainly is worldwide. Uh, tetanus we know still exists, even here in Indiana. Uh, that's a soil-borne illness, so um, people need to stay up to date on their tetanus boosters, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Whooping cough is definitely uh, still around. I have seen whooping cough, and that can be a life-threatening illness, particularly to children. Um, Haemophilus influenza type B, or Hib, it's called, uh, is a, a four-shot series uh, given to children from two months of age up through 18 months. Hib used to be a common cause of ear infections, uh, more importantly, it was uh, also a cause of a condition called epiglottitis, where there was swelling of a structure in the throat called the epiglottis. It could lead to severe respiratory problems, even cause children to end up on the ventilator. I have seen that disease in my um, career, but not in the last several years because of the vaccine. A pneumonia vaccine, it's called Prevnar. Um, Prevnar 13, that's the, the strength that we give the children. It um, causes immunity to 13 strains of the pneumococcal bacteria. Uh, pneumococcal is a, the common and perhaps most severe form of pneumonia. And since we've started developing children, they, I have not seen any pneumococcal pneumonia. Now they can still get pneumonia from viruses and a few other organisms, but the bad actor, the pneumococcal pneumonia, is not so much of a problem anymore. Uh, polio, back in the 50s, uh, that was a major um, problem in the United States. Parents were scared to death that their children were going to get polio right. and end up paralyzed. And there are still adults who have the, the um, are suffering the consequences of polio that they had as, as children. Um, and again, that's almost eradicated in the United States, almost eradicated worldwide. We hope that soon it will be uh, go the same route as smallpox, meaning that it does not exist anywhere in the world uh, because of immunizations. Um, measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR, that's a combination shot that's given uh, to children, usually uh, 12 to 18 months of age, and then again upon entering the sixth grade. As I said earlier, um, because of the outbreak at IU and a few other outbreaks, we now know that the Immunity from the first shot is not lifelong, so we have to give a booster, and that's now routine, at least in this state. Okay. Uh, varicella or chickenpox uh, vaccine, uh, that's also a two-shot series. Uh, chickenpox is, is um, not very common anymore because of the vaccine. The problem with chickenpox is, uh, number one, people who, uh, children included, who come down with chickenpox can go ahead and develop pneumonia, which is, of course, serious. The other problem is that if you have chicken pox, then as an adult, you're liable to get shingles. And that, if any of you have ever had shingles, that's not a very pleasant thing to, to suffer through. Hepatitis A is one of the new vaccines. Uh, it was recommended, but it is now required. Uh, so the older children uh, may or may not have had hepatitis A, depending, depending on their particular provider, but the younger kids are now required to get it. Hepatitis A is a foodborne hepatitis. It's not as serious as hepatitis B or C. It does not lead to liver failure um, or to cancer of the liver, but it does cause um, a gastroenteritis type of infection. Um, meningitis, 
or meningococcal uh, vaccine is now a two-shot series. Um, it's given once in the sixth grade and then again to seniors in high school. Uh, the second shot is designed to protect them when they go to college. Uh, meningitis used to be a, a problem in colleges because the kids live in dormitories, they're fairly close together, and they, if they weren't immune to it, they could spread it easily. Meningitis, as you know, can be a fatal, very, very serious disease. Uh, can cause some, even if you recover, can cause some very serious uh, sequelae, and uh, it's not a very uh, pleasant disease to have. Um, bacterial meningitis, because of the vaccine, is pretty much non-existent nowadays. Um, that pretty much covers okay. childhood vaccines. Now there's adult vaccines. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the flu shot, the flu vaccine. Um, in my example of herd immunity, um, because of that, I would strongly encourage everyone uh, to get a flu vaccine unless it's contraindicated, which is basically an allergy to eggs. Uh, there are different strengths of flu vaccine, and you should talk to your individual provider about which one they think is most appropriate for you. Flu is a little bit um, different than some of the other vaccine, and that is that you have to get it every year. And the reason for that, the influenza virus has the unique capability of changing itself. Uh, so the um, influenza virus that's circulating in Rochester, Indiana this year may change itself and be something different next year, and that's why you have to get a vaccine every year. The CDC tries to predict ahead of time which virus is going to be affecting us, or which strain rather, and design a uh, vaccine against that particular strain. And um, some years they, they guess much better than others. <laughs> <laughs> they think they have guessed very well this year. We'll I think see. so, uh, we hope. Um, there is also a, a vaccine that's uh, suggested for adults. It's called Tdap. That stands for tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. That's different than the vaccine that the children get uh, in that this is designed to be a uh, booster. Uh, it's recommended for all adults to get this every 10 years just to keep their immunity up. Um, it's also recommended that all pregnant women get it, regardless of when they may have had the last vaccine. The reason for that is uh, through immunity, through um, their immune system to the, to the unborn baby, it helps protect the baby against whooping cough until the baby gets old enough to start getting its own vaccinations. So that's the reason for that. Um, pneumococcal vaccine um, is recommended for all adults um, beginning at age 65. Um, <clears throat> there are actually two different forms of pneumonia vaccine. Uh, one of them we have had for a number of years and that's a vaccine that's typically recommended every five years as a booster. Um, CDC and Medicare are now recommending that adults get a one-time dose of what's called Prevnar, which is a 13 strain pneumonia which gives them an additional immunity against the uh, pneumococcus uh, bacteria. Okay. Um, and it's the, still up in the air, even though Medicare and CDC are recommending it, whether Medicare is going to pay for it or not. That, uh, <laughs> that remains to be seen. Uh, another vaccine I want to talk about is a shingles vaccine. It is recommended for all adults over the age of 60. Uh, it typically is not paid for by uh, third-party payers. Um, and what I would suggest if you're interested in the shingles vaccine is that you talk to your provider or your pharmacist and see if it will be covered on your particular plan. Uh, the last immunization I would like to talk about um, is uh, one called Gardasil. That's the brand name. It protects young people against the human papilloma virus or the HPV virus. It is recommended um, or has been recommended for the last few years for young ladies starting at the age of 12 up through the age of 26, I believe. Um, and the idea is it protects them against four strains of the HPV virus. And those four strains are known to cause cervical cancer, um, venereal warts, and uh, other sexually transmitted sorts of viruses. Um, it's about 70% effective at preventing those four strains from developing those diseases. It has just, within the last two years, been approved by CDC for young men in the same ages, 12 to 26, which makes sense because they're the ones sure. who are passing the virus. Sure. So, and it's not required at this point, it is uh, optional. 
Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a no-brainer. I mean, if you can take a three-shot series that has really no side effects that may prevent somebody from getting cancer down the road or uh, severe venereal warts, you know, like I said, it's a no-brainer. Okay. Why, would, why would somebody not want to do it? So I would ask people to seriously consider that or talk to their provider about that one. Um, we're very fortunate in this county and that there are several places that people can go to get immunizations. Uh, several of the clinics, including the Woodlawn Clinics, provide immunizations and we have a very active health department. Uh, Rhonda Barnett uh, gives lots of, of immunizations at the health department, both to kids and to adults. Okay, excellent. And, uh, so they're readily available. Um, I think that's the end of my spiel unless someone has some questions. <laughs> Dr. Michael Brubaker, our guest on Doc Talk today. and. Dr. Brubaker, I think very, very good information. I think people will probably relate to this. The, the whole bottom line that we're saying is get your vaccinations. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's what it amounts to, right? <laughs> you summed it up beautifully. <laughs> How can we get a hold of you if we have further questions or things we'd like to discuss further with you? Call the clinic and talk okay. to myself or one of my nurses. All right. Dr. Brubaker, thank you very much. From a baby's first steps to walking your daughter down the aisle, so many of life's precious moments are spent on our feet, and every step you take contributes to a healthier heart. By walking briskly for just 30 minutes a day, you can lower your risk for heart disease and stroke. So join us and take the first step to a healthier, longer life. The American Heart Association. Life. Life is why. The Akron Medical Center is accepting new patients. Call today and take the first step to a healthier heart.